Right. Well, good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to this uh, latest SAMPS webinar. Uh, this is actually the second uh, SAMPS webinar that we've held uh, in this month of uh, June. So I'm uh, very excited to uh, be hosting uh, this today. For those of you who are not familiar with SAMPS, uh, SAMPS stands for Sales and Marketing Professionals in Science. It's a, a non-for-profit, all-volunteer organization that was actually founded back in 2012. It exists to connect and empower uh, sales and marketing professionals in the life sciences, as well as applied uh, uh, research markets to help uh, them all grow professionally. As you may know, there's not many organizations that focus specifically in, on sales and marketing in the life sciences. So we uh, try and fill that uh, gap. Throughout the pandemic, we've been running these uh, webinars fairly regularly, uh, roughly monthly. But I'm pleased to say uh, a couple of weeks ago, we held our first face-to-face -face meeting uh, after many years in Glasgow. Uh, and it was great to uh, meet with uh, a number of uh, European colleagues uh, in the same sort of industry. And uh, although this will be uh, the last uh, webinar before we take a break for a couple of months of the summer, uh, we do have our next sort of face-to-face -face meeting in um, December uh, in Boston, uh, which uh, you'll be able to find details on the website. So without further ado, I uh, would like to introduce myself. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andy Batera. Uh, my day job is Executive Director of Marketing and Sales at a company called New England Biolabs. But I'm also the uh, one of the board members for the SAMHSA organization, which is uh, the role I'm playing today. Our webinar today uh, is an exciting one. Uh, it's entitled The Revolving Commercial Door, How Do We Retain Talent? As I'm sure you're all aware, the talent market within the life sciences is certainly uh, an interesting and challenging uh, environment today. Certainly in the New England area that uh, I'm, uh, uh, I live in, uh, we know how challenging it can be to recruit staff uh, with all the different uh, options that exist for people, as well as this new sort of hybrid world that we live in. Uh, but also of late, sadly, there's also been some layoffs. Uh, so that adds a different dimension to that as well. So I have uh, three great uh, guests and panelists with me today who are going to be discussing this topic. And I'm going to kick things off by asking them to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about uh, who they are, their job history, if you like, and how long they've been with their current employer to uh, kick us off in this session. So Tina, would you like to kick us off and tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, the role you play? Yes, sure. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me here. My name is Tina. I'm the marketing manager working right now in Resolve Biosciences. And um, our company is specializing in developing a like, high dimensional single cell multi-omics platform using spatial biology. Uh, I've been part of the Resolve team for two and a half years and my role involves a wide range of tasks, including building our corporate brand, increasing the brand awareness through marketing campaigns and events, supporting the sales team by creating sales tools, managing various uh, digital marketing activities like managing the uh, website content development, social media platform. And before joining Resolve, I completed my study in biochemistry and molecular biology. And I also work in multiple research labs. Uh, that is focusing more in immunology. Great. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Heather, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning. Um, my name is Heather Ride, and I lead the Global Commercial Operations Team for the Transplant Diagnostics Division for Thermo Fisher Scientific. I've been in this role here at Thermo for about three years now, and uh, the role and responsibility that I have on the day-to-day -day is to look after everything customer-facing, so market development, sales, customer service, field applications and engineering, sales operations, and uh, commercial functions for the, for the division. Um, my career prior to this role was spent a little bit of time on the bench a few um, early in my career um, in, a, in a company now owned by Pfizer, and then moved into a sales role and uh, proceeded my career through uh, selling organizations um, and then to district you know, management and into commercial leadership. And um, that was quite a long time ago. We won't state how many years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Heather. And last but not means least, uh, Linda. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I'm Linda Stecky, the Director of HR at New England Biolabs. I do work with Andy Bertera. For those of you that don't know, New England Biolabs, um, we were founded almost 50 years ago. We're based in Ipswich, Massachusetts. We have five facilities across Massachusetts. Um, I've been in HR 27 years, and I believe the reason why I've been invited for uh, today's panel is um, I get to share some perspective and some examples of the unique culture that NEB has that I believe is why we have such high retention. So excited to uh, share some of those perspectives today. So thank you. 
Excellent. Well, welcome, everybody. As you'll see, we have different people at uh, different uh, stages of their career, let's say, and lengths in different companies, as well as uh, both well, all of sales, marketing, and HR represented here today. So let's kick off with some questions. Uh, maybe I can ask you first, uh, Linda, just building on the comment you mentioned about New England Biolab's uh, retention rate. Perhaps what are the pluses and uh, minuses of uh, having employees stay with a company for a long period of time? So a few things come to mind, and this is a question I've thought about certainly working in HR, but so my response though is gonna be really directed towards New England Biolab. So my experience here at NEB, we have an average tenure of just over nine years. Um, so when I think about the pluses of having long tenure, I'm thinking about uh, the ability to maintain our strong culture, the ability to, um, create connections and relationships, a closeness that I feel is something that's um, a reason why employees continue to work here at New England Biolabs. I think about Gallup, which um, they did a survey many, many years ago, and I think it holds true today, that they defined 12 employee uh, basic needs. And they said, one of those needs is, do you have a best friend at work? And um, that maintains employee engagement. So I wanna say that we have that here at New England Biolabs. Um, our leaders, which I believe is a, is a very nice, unique um, thing here at NAB, is that they really care about our employees. Um, it starts from the top, from our founder, Don Combe, to our chairman of the board, who retired last year as CEO, but I were reported to for close to 14 years. A personal story that I'll share with you that I like to share with folks, and it just speaks to who he is, and again, what he's instilled in all of us at NAB, it permeates throughout the company. Um, several years ago, my son was sick. He was in the hospital for about three weeks. Jim Mallard said to me, don't worry about work. He said, uh, just focus on your son. He called me every single day. And it wasn't until two weeks in, I was at the hospital that he, he you could tell that he was still very concerned, came to the hospital, brought lunch for my husband and me, and he sat with us. Now that meant so much to me as an employee, as a CEO, who's incredibly busy that took the time to do that. So that's that connection, that relationship that we have here at NEB. And he didn't just do that for me. There's so many more examples of he, him doing that for others. And I know Andy does that for his team as well. So we're there for our employees. And um, I believe that's some of the pluses. It's that longevity, that connection. Some other things that are more HR related responses. Um, we reap the rewards of employee development. So we invest in our employees. We invest in their professional and scientific development. We, uh, we encourage everybody in the company from shippers to packagers to HR to scientists to attend conferences. We don't just limit those to certain individuals in the company. So when we invest and those employees stay long-term, we benefit from the skill set that they're building to the knowledge that the, the knowledge that they are uh, building. So we benefit as an organization as a result of that investment. Succession planning um, is easier when you have long-tenured and tenured employees. Um, when you, also, when you have long tenured employees, they're gaining a certain level of expertise that could be institutional knowledge about the company, cultural values, and the, just the knowledge themselves about their science, about their work. And they have an opportunity to be seen by others as mentors in the organization, which many folks certainly enjoy having that role. And last but not least, replacing an employee is expensive. So we do not have to, um, thankfully, because our retention is so high. Um, as we, yes, we're growing as a company, we're hiring, but when turnover is low, we're not having to worry about replacing those employees and retraining those employees. So that's certainly a plus. Now minuses, maybe we have to be focused as an employee, as, a, as managers. Sometimes individuals may think, well, um, they may be resistant to change. Well, this is just how we've, all, how we've always done that. So as managers, we're just mindful of that and making sure that we keep an open mind and everybody's, um, you know, open to new ideas. So that's that's what I have to say about the pluses and minuses of long tenured employees. That's great, Linda, and I uh, appreciate you sharing the personal story there, which I think makes it uh, ever more poignant as to uh, the examples you gave. Uh, and obviously I'm biased here, so I know some of the uh, examples you, you highlighted as well. Uh, Heather, perhaps you can uh, build on that. Uh, obviously, you've been in your current role for a while now, and uh, obviously, Zoom was a very large organization. Sure. And and hard to get those personal touches in a larger organization, but uh, what would you add to those? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, for a company like Thermo Fisher, each division has its own culture and, uh, and you know, in the groups above that. So I think for us, it's 
really making sure that we have diverse teams is really important, I think. And so that comes with tenure. So like sometimes it's, you know, people with long tenure for the things Linda had mentioned, where there is some cultural things that you want to keep in the organization. And I think having uh, some newer employees um, kind of brings new perspective um, into it. So in, a, in the overall in the organization, I like when teams are diverse in their tenure with the organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the great advantages to having people stay with an organization for a long time for their benefit, um, especially at a company like Thermo Fisher, is that there's a lot of opportunity for advancement, whether that's within the division or throughout the company. Um, but I also think that the, the advantages to our, to our customers that we're serving are very mindful in the sense of the relationships that they're building with these individuals. They stay those relationships for the long course of time. Um, it's good and bad in that way because we become so comfortable and familiar with our, our customers that we just assume a lot of things. So as a commercial leader, you know, it's like, how do you continue to develop that relationship and ask the harder questions instead of just those friendly conversations? And that's where I think the other side of having new folks come in after a territory has been vacant, for example, in a selling role is, um, is that they actually think about it from a different lens. And so that's, that's the advantage there. Um, I think on the other side, when you start thinking about the marketing part of the organization, really just where the customer journeys and things like that go, it's really a beautiful story when you have someone with tenure and kind of see where we started and where we're trying to go. Um, but overall, I think, you know, diversity um, among the team is probably the thing I like to see the most. Um, one other disadvantage, I think, when you have a team of tenured individuals, this group think starts to happen um, and the resistance to change becomes pretty serious um, across the board. And, you know, I've been in this situation before um, when we had to make some real serious changes and the whole team had never been through change management of any sort. And that's a big lift for the company um, and for HR and for the leaders that are part of this team. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think, you know, as Linda mentioned, the more fresh we can keep our leaders um, in the organization around change and thinking differently, that helps when we have to make, you know, difficult decisions or we're changing course in some direction. So I think, you know, diversity and then just always being mindful that change is the constant, that it's always going to happen, particularly um, in large organizations, there's always change. So I think that um, comes from, the, from where the diversity among the team will help with those kind of adjustments. Yeah, great comments, Heather, and obviously some overlap with what Linda said in terms of connections uh, being a plus in terms of longevity, both in the organization and externally, and then that change is actually a good thing, not always uh, a bad thing. Uh, uh, Tina, how would you respond to that question? Obviously, uh, in, a, in a much smaller organization, maybe more of a, you know, on a, it's not a startup, I appreciate, but more in that sort of vein than uh, the longevity that uh, Tim Fisher and NEB have been around. Yeah, so um, having an employee uh, staying in a company for an extended period of time can help um, who have a deeper understanding of not just how the company works from the operation and cultural perspective, but also strategies wise, uh, knowing what has been working in the past and what doesn't work. For example, in the marketing, we often um, put more resources in, for example, a certain trade show. Uh, and why do we put more resources on that? Maybe in the past, we have experienced some kind of a good ROI with that event, and we have some good experience with the organization. And sometimes it's hard for uh, new people who just joined the company uh, to see that. So, um, so definitely it's help. And marketing also requires some kind of a deeper understanding of their competitor, competitor landscape. And it's not so easy to to get into the industry immediately. It's required a lot of uh, conversation with the customers and also study some kind of publications. So um, having an employee stay, having a colleague actually stay in the, in the, in the company for a longer time, it helps to build those expertise and definitely agree with what Linda has said in the previously. And, and on the downside um, is that it's um, when you have a company when they have an employee that stay in a longer time, you often have kind of a blind spot in the operation. You don't really see um, why you you just do things in a certain ways because it has been working for you in the past and you don't think about how to improve it. But uh, is there a ways that can make it more efficient, like building up templates, making it easier for other people to, to replicate your strategies? Uh, that's something that's some uh, fresh ideas that new people can bring in. Um, and also like uh, uh, in marketing, you will often talk about uh, having the creativity. And when you stay in the industry for 10 years, 20 years, often you are, your mindset is very restricted by your current industry. And maybe having someone who is coming, uh, coming from a different industry, for example, in the consumer market, they often uh, have um, in the marketing message, maybe they have more emotional approach. We could be a which could be helpful even for the life science industry. Um, and that could help 
the company to you know to think outside of the box and to be more creative in terms of their the campaigns and strategies. Great points. So one of my former managers used the phrase steal with pride. And what, what he meant at the time was uh, if you see ideas in other industries, in um, you know, uh, different uh, companies, you know, don't be afraid to take them into your own company and reinvent them. So I think some great points there. Uh, we're starting to get some questions on the uh, Q&A, and I just wanted to remind the audience that if you have any questions, there's a Q&A button at the uh, bot bottom of the screen. So feel free to uh, ask them via that uh, route, and I'll sort of uh, uh, ask them to the panelists. Um, Tina, just extending the, the discussion we were just having there, uh, obviously, you know, you're, you're relatively uh, at an earlier stage in your career. Uh, what are you looking for from an employer to, uh, if you were going to stay in the same company, let's say for the next decade, what would you be looking for from that, uh, from your employer? Um, I would definitely say it's some kind of growth opportunity and especially for someone like me who is very early in their career, uh, in our career and providing us an opportunity to grow and able to try different new things. See, it's very critical in our career development. And I find myself very fortunate enough and to be in a, in a startup company where I have just a dozens of opportunities to, to learn and go beyond my comfort zone and achieving more I could imagine. It's just very rewarding. Um, so if you, if you are passionate about your work and you can overcome the challenges on the way and you contribute to the success of the company, those sense of achievement and experience you gain, it's it's very valuable. And it's some, something that I'm definitely looking for in a, staying in the company for a longer term. Great. Uh, Heather, maybe it's the reverse. What, what has uh, made you stay at, uh, at uh, Thermo Fisher in, 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 for the uh, period you've been there? Yeah, I think, you know, you have to find, and, you know, I've taken a couple of hiatuses over the course of my career, you know, Thermo is a very large organization. I came from legacy companies that were acquired by Thermo. And so like, you know, sometimes you get to the point where you feel like you can't really get the next kind of skill set you want, whether it's in the division or group that you're in. And I think that's when you start looking outside the company, but there's like the same things for Thermo Fisher that pull me back, right? Like there's a, there's a culture of certain things, um, and we call them the four I values. And that's like at the core of who I am are really in those four I values. And so as I'm getting further along in my career, I'm realizing that it's not really just about the money. It's about the mission of the company. And, um, you know, it also like, you know, the growth opportunities don't necessarily mean title. It's about doing things that inspire me every day. Um, you know, of course, you have to pay your bills and eat and take care of your children and things like that. But it's about so much more. And I think that comes as you get later in life and you start to reflect back that like you're on the other half now. and um, I think that looking at that is, you know, growth comes in a lot of different ways and it doesn't always have to come with a promotion or a pay increase. So I think for me, the reason that Thermo has been so attractive to me and sort of folks on my team is really understanding what those skill sets that you want to learn or be challenged to learn or participate in, those opportunities are kind of endless at a company like this. And also, you know, I'm a pretty intense person, I would say, and that isn't always appreciated in other organizations because that, but at, at Thermo Fisher, you know, their diversity is appreciated, but I think different kinds of, you know, personalities and stuff are appreciated. Intensity is a core value for us, you know, taking care of the customer is top of mind for me every day. And I want to be around all functions who think the same way. So I think for me, that's, that's a big factor for other people. I think that work here at Thermo Fisher that maybe have gone through the same challenge or have been here for a long time. Um, you know, is, is, is this, you know, the right job, but the opportunity is like, if you, some people are comfortable doing the same thing every day for their whole career, you know, or just changing within that same role. And that's hundred percent. Okay. You bring, bring assets. But I think overall for me, it really just comes to, as long as I feel like I'm being challenged and I'm being appreciated and I feel like part of a team, then, then for me, I think that that's the biggest factor. Wonderful. Uh, Linda, anything you want to add to that from not necessarily just NEB, but your own personal experience, having been at NEB for a while now? Yeah, from my own personal experience, so scientists are motivated by not money. They're motivated by the work. They're motivated by the collaborative work environment, the opportunities. But when I think about um, other factors, I'm thinking about sort of getting the basics right from an HR perspective, making sure that you have a really strong benefits package. We're really proud of what we offer here at New England Biolabs. But then recognizing as... Um, we have four and at NEB, we have five generations in the workplace and each individual is motivated differently. So thinking about a little bit of what Heather has said is what motivates you? And you know, you said being appreciated. I had a conversation recently with an employee who said they're not motivated by money, they're motivated by feeling appreciated for the work that they're doing and knowing that their opinions are valued. So that's one thing. And then as I think about recruitment, um, 
what's really important to a lot of folks is uh, the ability to work uh, remotely or hybrid, uh, NEB values FaceTime. And that's certainly something that we're challenged by, but we see the value in that, but we do offer flexibility, but our leaders are here um, on site. They don't work remotely. So um, I know that that's a factor as well. But in job stability, we promote job stability at NEB. In 50 years, we've never had to do any layoffs. So we're really proud of that as well. So those are the, some of the things that I think are factors. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a question coming in from the audience. Uh, one of them, and I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase, talks about perhaps the uh, downside of being in a, in a company for a long time. I, I know that uh, I had a discussion with somebody we recently hired and they'd been at uh, a company for, I think, over 20 years. And they said they spoke to a recruiter and they said, oh, that's a red flag. You know, why have you been over that company for, for one, you know, for that length of time? You know, you must have, uh, you must not be good enough almost to, uh, you know, spread your wings and go elsewhere. Um, maybe a question for you, Linda, you know, it, you know if, uh, if somebody thinks, you know, not about, uh, you know, progressing their career, you know, can it be viewed, staying in one company can be, uh, you know, um, detrimental if they want to actually go to another company? There might be some bias there from some folks that may think that that individual is only, they only know how that company does things. They only know the systems and the processes of that particular organization, and they haven't had an opportunity to experience other ways of working or other ways, other systems and processes. So there may be some bias there. Yes, I have seen that. Yeah. We, of course, love that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's says a lot for us. Loyalty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Heather, any comments on that? Because I know and maybe this is unfair to say, but I think salespeople have a probably a better, rep a worse reputation from moving uh, from one company to another than, than other roles. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I when I see someone at a long term at a company, I try to look at the evolution of the roles that they've held at the company. So if they've come into a certain role, you know, and they've stayed in that same role and the company hasn't evolved, because if you come into a company in a startup mode and then you're, you know, now all of a sudden you're a 50 million or $150 million company, it's a very different trajectory. Your job from day one to the end is very different. So I think if I'm looking at a resume of someone who's been at a job for 10 plus years is one, how's the company evolved during that time? What impact did they have on that change in the company? And then also just their role. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they had to take, you know, say if it's an example for a sales role, you know, have they been able to evolve? So if someone's been in a role for 10 or 15 years and hasn't seen any sort of promotion, I'd really need to understand the company. Like, do they have a senior level person? Why are they not being considered for those kind of roles? Um, but I don't think it's an, it's a detriment. I think the part is, you know, if I'm a hiring manager, I would pressure test that a little bit to just, you know, really understand why they, why they've stayed there. And it could be all these things that Linda, I have some friends who work with NEB and once they went there, they never left. Right. And so as much as we try to recruit them to other places, they don't leave. So I, um, I think the, there's something in the special sauce. So it could be that. And then why, I think the bigger question is why you want to change now. And that could just be because they feel like they need to, or maybe they're feeling like they should, so they're not obsolete, like the question had mentioned. So I think it's really, um, you know, from a hiring manager perspective, you need to dig into that a little bit. Um, I don't think that, you know, I would hate for anyone to feel like that would make you obsolete to work at a company, because I think that that's pretty short-sighted of whoever's on the other side of that interview chair. Great comment. <laughs> Uh, uh, Tina, some of the comments have been made there about people who've been in the same position for a long time. Obviously, there is change going on, you know, change that uh, motivates them, change that keeps them sharp. One of the biggest changes over the last couple of years, uh, particularly perhaps more for marketing staff, has been the whole hybrid working or maybe remote working. Um, and certainly, I know we've had a number of applicants where that's almost been a prerequisite uh, for joining. Uh, Tina, any thoughts on how hybrid or ability to have flexibility in the workplace uh, relates to working for the same company for a long time? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. Okay, sorry. I mean, definitely, it's a it's a plus side for the for the recruitment because nowadays, just after COVID, everyone is just so used to working in the hybrid style, and uh, having uh, the benefits of it is just having more work life balance. You don't always need to be in the office from nine to five, but you can actually do sports, for example, in your in your lunch time, and health is also part of the in important expert in your life. So, helping having the hybrid style help you to maintain those uh, the the, the private life that you want to have. But of course, the downside is it's harder to build um, a personal relationship with the colleagues because you don't really see them that often anymore. If you're working in the office just one time per 
per week, then it's actually hard to to see them. Um, and if and they might even just come in a different time. So the downside, it's 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 probably the relationship with the colleagues. Um, but I do see that from the marketing perspective, um, we are our day job is doesn't really require to be in the office but uh you just need to have a laptop at home and that's already pretty much it's and i think it's you always need to take the balance of working in the office and working remotely yeah so flexibility obviously uh is an added benefit i guess is a summary of that yeah definitely yeah uh linda a question that's come in from the uh audience is uh uh, whether any of the panelists have used different forms of what sort of forms of engagement uh, have been used to get a, uh, an indication of whether employees are, are, are sort of, uh, I suppose, happy. Specifically uh, mentioned is, do you do any pulse type surveys uh, as a way of measuring the level of engagement of employees at a company? Good question. Um, so I can tell you that we don't we don't do pulse surveys formally. However, one of the things that I, we pride ourselves in is everybody's accessible. You can walk up to the CEO, Sal Rosello. You can walk up to Andy, to me. You can share your thoughts and opinions. Uh, we want to hear them. So we don't um, necessarily do a formal pulse survey, but I do in HR. My team does check in with new hires. And then at the on that occasion where an employee does leave, we do do the exit interviews and we find out and try to understand why they're leaving. But um, we have participated, and you may recall, in the best places to work survey. So those have been giving us some good feedback. Um, but not a, on a regular basis, we do not currently do that because we do have an open door policy that is it's real. Heather, is that something you, you've experienced? These oh, yes. Policies? Yeah, we, we we do. Right. I think it's part of a big company thing um, um, for sure. So we every year annually in the fall time, there's an employee engagement survey. We've hired third party companies that kind of put the surveys out there. So it's in an anonymous sort of fashion. Um, the questions are very similar year after year within the surveys. I believe the vendor we used last year was Glint. Um, and the, for me as a leader, I have several direct reports and their teams and functions underneath them. They're, they're so priceless to me to be able to get that information. I tried to hold skip level meetings, but the, um, the tone and the, you know, that comes through in these and the commentary, and sometimes we're not shocked by it. I, the one thing I wish that, you know, as a company or that just at the industry we did more of was do these more often, um, because whatever's happening in the first, that time period, a couple of weeks around that time, that's everything people are feeling. And so I think it's a pulse for that moment, but I don't think it's necessarily a pulse of how they're feeling um, for the for the whole year or for, for a piece of time. And so, for example, if you've had some massive change management and that survey comes out, that is very impactful, right? Or if, um, if you know, there's a, you know, challenge with, you know, customers or things like that, it really shines through. And so... I think you know perhaps those things should be done more than once a year, um, and then periodically. We also have the ability um, to do pulse surveys like on our own through like our HR teams, so that it's kind of anonymous if we're feeling like the team needs some additional engagement. I think those kind of surveys are good, um, particularly for higher leadership levels to get a feeling about how customers are, or how how people are feeling in their jobs, and how proud they are to work for the company. To be very frank, though, in my whole tenure as a leader here, always the same few things pop up as challenges when you start to see, you know, like, what are the challenges? Like, people are, you know, are they feeling included and all that? Yes, absolutely. But it's always the same things. And I think some of the comments you made about remote work and things like that are really playing into that a little bit um, for people who are, you know, salespeople have kind of been remote forever, but other roles is people, you know, or barriers to entry, things like that, or stress. And I think our world is just feeling those things across the board. So how much of that is home life and the world coming into work? And so I think that they're valuable, but I think, you know, the weight that you put on the different areas and the things that you want to improve on, um, they need a little bit more digging in. Um, and I, I'd say across our division, across the different functional leaders across the company, they're kind of the same things that you always kind of boil to the top. Um, but I, I think I'm a huge advocate for them. So I would highly recommend uh, for any for any person, particularly if you have a lot of direct reports to have people underneath them. It's a, it's a good pulse of how things are going. Great, great to hear that, that's been used so uh, completely and holistically. Uh, Tina, I guess in a smaller organization, maybe you don't use surveys. Is, is that true or do you do use them? Yeah, I don't know. I, it's um, actually we do we do kind of uh, this kind of survey periodically, and I don't know whether it's 
because we are kind of a small company, but maybe it's something related to the German company as well that it's uh, necessary to use it. But uh, yeah, I think we have this survey called the business health score. So it's kind of help you to, it's anonymously, so everyone can participate, but they, they, there is no name um, that it's mentioned in the survey, but it helps the company to measure the stress level um, of the employees. And especially for a startup company, we have sometimes that it's, uh, that have very urgent deadlines to launch a product, to launch your kids for example um, and those times you it's 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 particularly critical to uh, for the for the leadership team to understanding what is the 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 level of stress of the employees and so they can help um, by by having some kind of measurements they can they can help with releasing the relieving those stress great thank you there's a couple of questions come in uh, of a similar nature revolving around uh, changes I guess uh, relating to you know uh, things that happened during the pandemic and now being in this sort of post uh, post covid post pandemic world um you know one one talking about um a topic we already covered a little bit in terms of changes due to uh, uh work life balance uh, and the importance of that as a non monetary benefit and uh, have compensation packages changed to encompass that uh, going forward you know as we leave the pandemic Another one relating to the so-called great resignation and uh, are things differently post-pandemic to retain staff? So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll split those up. Uh, um, maybe start start with yourself, uh, Linda. Firstly, in terms of compensation, um, in your experience, you've seen trends or changes in in the way companies compensate their employees post-pandemic relative to uh, perhaps pre-pandemic, or is it coming full circle? Maybe. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to think if we've seen it. We have not adjusted our compensation philosophy here at New England Biolabs, but I know some organizations have had to deal with remote workers across the United States and whether or not they factor in cost of living if somebody lives in Georgia versus somebody who's living in California. So I know that's been a, a conversation over the last year in terms of how do you adjust to that? And some companies have chosen not to look at cost of living while some do. So I know that's been a, a, a conversation within the HR realm, but here at NEB, we have not adjusted ours. Uh, Heather, anything uh, you've seen in uh, your organization or elsewhere? Yeah, I think um, I, I would say you mentioned the word full circle there for a little bit. <laughs> I think that post pandemic, you know, from a from an overall, I mean, I think that, you know, companies probably had to deal with the inflationary part and Thermo Fisher, I think, was very fair during that time as we saw prices of things going up in the world, at least particularly here in North America, kind of help the, you know, people, their employees adjust for that, which was, I think, very great. Um, now, as we kind of maybe those things are a little bit more stabilized and you're seeing the other economic pressures around the world in different ways. Um, I think that overall comp structure probably hasn't changed too much. I will tell you, you know, there's a question in there a little bit about resignation in there as well. And what I would say is there was a period of time, you know, during the pandemic. And I think part of that was probably a lack of connection to the people that you work with really inspired a lot of that, you know, that time. And then as that compensation stuff had to change, you saw a lot of companies becoming very aggressive because the pool of hiring was so small on salaries and benefits and things like that, that you just couldn't compete with, right? At a company of our size. And so we saw a lot of people be really tempted by that. Um, I think it's kind of come full circle. We've seen a lot of people who made those moves to smaller organizations. It kind of, they've been, you know, those roles have been eliminated. The coal companies have closed or lost their capital funding and things like that. So I think there's, you know, and from a larger company perspective, there's a bit more stability. Um, you know, no one is immune to what's going on in our world today, but I think it's kind of come around full circle where people are looking at the total package and not just about the base salary or the commission plan, but looking at, you know, benefits. And for some folks, it is that remote work and the flexibility and um, I think it's kind of come back around. Uh, no doubt our world has changed. And so I, I, I think that it'll be interesting to see over the next few years, just how that all plays out for sure. But I, I think that the compensation um, structures are something that you have to evaluate all the time and in the competitive environment for sure, because every company is looking at this very differently. Great comments. Uh, Tina, anything you want to add? Or? Um, I cannot comment on it too much because our company basically found during COVID. So I was like, can I don't really understand what we have before the COVID, but uh, I mean, flexible working style is what we have right now in the company as well. And um, I think I see a lot of great benefits of it. And and like Heather already mentioned, uh, there are, it's just how people to get their work-life balance and being more flexible with their lifestyle. Great. 
Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll keep with yourself, Tina. Um, connections has come up as a theme in a number of the answers uh, to questions that have been raised thus far. Uh, can you comment on the importance of the role of the manager uh, in retaining staff? I know, certainly I know from my own experience, uh, one of our, our sales managers, people have followed him from company to company, you know, because it's about the relationship he has with his team more than the company they work for. So I don't know whether that's something you, you would comment on. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I was very fortunate enough to have two former managers that are really, really good. And they have been a good mentor for me because I am very early in my in my career. And so having and also I have more the technical background and uh, I'm quite new in marketing. So having the mentor for me and giving me guiding me through uh, the challenges is definitely helpful in my career. And they and a uh, good man, a uh, good managers also help with creating a positive and inclusive work environment, which I think it's very important for someone who is, who is uh, early in their career so that they can, being, being more inclusive, allow them to, to try many different things and not to be afraid of fail, uh, failure, uh, but also keeping the creativity to, to just try and, and learn from the process. Um, it also helps with, um, unleashing the potential of uh, each individual right so not everyone can get on their job uh, hit the ground and running uh, immediately but uh, it might take some time to to learn about the process and and to know to navigate their way in their career and i think having a great manager help with that great feedback uh, heather anything you'd add there maybe i could extend the question beyond manager to perhaps uh, the importance of coaches uh, particularly as you uh, go through your career yeah, I think it's a, I think it's super important to like from a manager perspective. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have some folks that worked with me before come along with me on on my journey, um, and that that's great, right? It gives trust. There's trust there. I think um, there's no doubt about it that the manager plays a huge part of the connection. Um, I think. It, and every it, at different points, right? So sometimes we kind of like, I don't want to use the word outgrow our manager, but there's people who have worked for on my teams before that are like, you know, probably ready to get, they probably even have more better skill sets in some cases than I do today. And so from that perspective is just kind of knowing when it's okay for you to kind of spread your wings and move on from that. Um, no doubt about it. The team connection, I think is another big factor, um, like, you know, whether or not the, the culture of the team. So the more touch points that a manager can have with those individuals, both personally and then as well as a team to kind of make people feel supported um, goes a real long way. You mentioned about coaches or, you know, mentors. It, it's so important. Like I, you know, I, I, and it's challenging, right? Because like sometimes people become like, I sometimes feel like I mentor a lot. Like, I'm like, gosh, this week was so busy and what happened? And I, because you don't ever want to say no. And then the reason for that is because I think it takes such courage for people to raise their hand and ask for someone to give them guidance. And so I never want to turn that away. And so I think we have a responsibility as we get further along in our careers to do that, but also for people to have that courage and that, you know, you can be a mentor. I, participated in a in a reverse mentorship program a couple of years ago and I had never been part of that and that was cool that was so cool <laughs> like to have someone who was like 23 years old and he was newer to sales like mentoring me right about how I, my style and my change was so I think that coaches and mentors can come in many different shapes and sizes and um, I'm fortunate uh, this person I worked for at 23 years old is still my mentor and I'm way older than 23 now and um, so I think that you know throughout my journey um, you know she's still a great you know friend and mentor so I think it's really important that people put that that stake into that and doesn't mean you have to work at the same company either but you can you can spread your wings in different ways and still keep those connections i think there's a wonderful comment particularly about the reverse uh coaching or reverse mentorship uh particularly in you know the fast moving world that we uh, live in you know some of the digital technologies unfortunately i just said uh, but the older you get the harder it is to sort of keep pace with them so learning from uh people who is let's say uh immersed in that is definitely a great great thing to do so awesome comment uh, Linda, any, any thoughts maybe on more formal programs around coaching and uh, um, uh, mentorship that uh, you know companies can help to uh, prolong their, uh, their, 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 their their employees' uh, tenure at companies? Um, specifically around offering these programs? Yeah, yeah. If you think that's uh, some from your experience that you know for is it is just maybe the question is does formalizing mentorship actually help? Mm. Depends on the organization. Um, I would say, yeah, Thermo, I can see large organization having more of a formal process here at NEB. Um, 
because of the culture that we have. I don't believe a formal process is necessary, but I'm encouraging individuals who may be quiet and not wanting to reach out, giving them that encouragement and opportunity. And um, again, folks here at NEB, they are not, they're not shy. They're, they, you can walk right up to any individual um, and ask for assistance. So um, I think some people might need more of a formal process in place and certainly in HR, we're happy to help them with that and, and connect them. Um, yeah. Coaching, I love coaching. So yes, yeah. coaching would be helpful to have maybe more of a formal one-on-one -on -one. and we have utilized services for coaching. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll stick with you, Linda. There was a question that came in uh, from um, the audience. Uh, for employees that have left voluntarily, do you have alumni groups or other plans in place to re-engage uh, uh, boomerang hires uh, from that alumni group? Um, uh, and if you do, please share any details. Yes. And what's amazing is it wasn't employee-led or HR-led. It was the individual retiree. We have a, a very active retiree group of individuals, alumni group that get together. And what we do as is, is a company is we welcome everyone back. I just last week saw retirees here in the cafeteria. So they're, they, once they leave, they're, they're still connected to NEB. They still hold those connections because they have those friendships and they want to see NEB succeed. And um, so, yes, we do have, uh, I think, I forget what they call themselves, but they they meet on a monthly basis, the retirees and the um, they talk about NEB. And yeah, so yes, we do have that. Great, thank you. Heather, is there anything similar in Thermo Fisher? Oh, company not that or? I'm aware of, but I was just thinking about it. You know, I came from iterations of Thermo, as I mentioned, I stepped out and went back and there was a Facebook that would group that was formed like a handful of years ago, pre, a previous company that's now owned by Thermo Fisher. And that group is pretty active. And so like, you know, they get together about once a quarter, it was pre-Thermo acquisition. But I, at Thermo, I was thinking about this because we do have a lot of Boomerang employees. And in fact, it happens a lot, um, almost to the point of like, do we, do we keep allowing this? <laughs> you start to think, right? Like what is the balance here of like people who go spread their wings and then within, you know, a year, and I thank God they allow it because that's how I came back in the short order the last time. Um, but I think, um, I think it's actually a really great thing. I think it's a, a great idea. And particularly because some people go off and they get some additional skill sets that could be so valuable to the organization. Also showing maybe newer employees that people can still be part of an ecosystem. Um, and that sparks some interest for me that maybe that's something that we we, we need to do. Yeah, excellent. Um, I, I, I guess Resolve is probably too 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 young to have a an alumni group, Tina. But I should I should ask the question of you just to be just to be safe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Indeed, we're too young for that, and uh, we have been our company is around only for two and a half years, I believe. Um, we don't have like anything that is formally supported, uh, supporting supporting this kind of alumni, but we we connect with other people privately, either through LinkedIn or just through WhatsApp group. So it's there is still opportunity to connect with the others, just not uh, in the formal process. Yeah. Um, changing topics a little bit. Uh, I think culture has been brought up a couple of times uh, as being important. Uh, maybe to yourself, Tina, obviously, I'm guessing Resolve is still trying to uh, evolve its cult culture, but uh, how important do you feel uh, the culture of the organization is to uh, bring employees together? Um, like I mentioned previously, um, I think having um, a more inclusive environment and letting people to try and and not to be a, a bit not to be af uh, afraid of failure and learn during um, in when they're overcoming the challenges is important i think in resolve we have those kind of uh we have the an inclusive environment that support early careers uh, people in the early careers to try out different things and also because uh, it's a startup company so they often offer a lot of bro um, opportunities to grow and learn i think that's that's very important um, and then we also have some um, i think every year we have some recognition and award and those are uh, the award that would be given to the people that uh, contributes the most to the company, or they have shown they have dedicated some uh, some level of effort, and um, yeah, so we we normally do that annually as well. Heather, I think you commented earlier that there's cultures both within uh, divisions of Thermo as well as obviously the company as a whole. So I don't know whether anything you'd add to that. 
sorry. I, I think Tina covered it pretty well. I think there, there's no doubt about it that like, you know, cultural does really make a difference. And I think, you know, like the celebration part of it, uh, you know, Tina had mentioned like that goes a real long way. And, um, you know, for sales folks, that's kind of common practices to have these awards, but how do you it roll that stuff out to other functions in the company, I think is so critical for, for organizations to do that. And, um, no, I, I think um, I think overall, you know, the culture piece is, you know, the, it's that statement that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Like, I don't think that there's any other uh, comment that's truer that I've seen in my career. Very good point. Uh, Linda, I want to ask you about culture because I think you, you addressed that very well in your, your opening remarks. Uh, there's a question here, which is an interesting one. Uh, I don't know that the case is cited here, but uh, the question is really about uh, how do non-compete uh, practices play in in the life sciences uh, in terms of, I guess, in this this example of, uh, of this discussion around uh, tenure? Um, you know, maybe it's more of a legal question. So if it's an awkward one, don't don't feel any don't compel to answer. But the question was, uh, what are the thoughts around non-compete practices within the life sciences? We here at any we don't have them here at NEB non competes um, and I hear more and more companies state regulations are not allowing them so if that's the answer they're seeking yeah Heather anything to add yeah I mean I think every company has their own approach to how you manage these um, you know I will tell you that like there I think that Linda's comment that they're probably harder to enforce. Um, over the course of time, I think every state kind of handles them differently. Um, you know, coming from a large organization, we take them pretty seriously for people coming into our organization that have them. We always inquire about that to just understand if there's, you know, any legal risk of, of you know, bringing someone in. I think a lot of the factor is, you know, when you're an employee and you have a skill set in a certain area and then you want to advance your career, sometimes you have to think about like the company that you're going to go choose or the role you're going to take. And, you know, I think that well, most companies are finding the balance with this of how much they try to enforce it, because I'd imagine it's expensive for them to try to enforce them. But I, I think at the end of the day, when it comes to it, you have to make a hard decision before you sign those things and really understand probably for your state or your area. Um, you know, I mean, right now, I mean, like, I think a lot of them are very, you know, like wrapped up that looks like you could never work anywhere else in the world ever in the life science industry. And so it's like, I think it's up to you and where you're going to go to work to understand what that means. So I think it's a uh, it's 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 understandable. We all learn a lot at the companies we're with, right? So I, I really understand why companies want these things to prevent, you know, those kind of sorts of things. But I think it's a personal choice and the company you're either leaving or going to to decide how legally they're going to be managing that. Yeah, not great. I will leave that one leave that one there for the moment. Um, uh, question that's come in is around um, you know lessons learned, if you like. So. Uh, um, Tina, any anything that you've seen that a company has made or an employer has made a mistake in uh, that they could learn from in terms of retaining talent? So, uh, any big mistakes that you've seen companies make that uh, they should avoid? Yeah, sometimes um, I think most of the time, company offer um, kind of financial incentive in, in order to save the uh, trying to retain the talents, but uh, most sometimes it's it's more about the company culture or um, there are other concern of the employees that they are, they're, they are not addressing. So for example, if you have a toxic working environment and you are not getting along with your manager, giving you more salary, for example, would not solve the fundamental issues. So really, I think most of the time, um, company might make mistake that they, they, they think money can solve everything, but that, that's, not the, that's not the issue. And sometimes they just need to understand more what is the, um, the real concern underlying their, their um, quitting, quitting the company, for example. Linda, any, any mistakes you've seen from your uh, uh, discussions with your HR network? Polarizing, but I would say um, counter-offering. So um, it really goes back to what Tina said. If somebody is leaving, uh, you really need to find out why they're leaving. It's not necessarily giving them more money. So if somebody comes to me and says that they are, you know, they have another opportunity, this company's gonna offer me X, then our philosophy here at NEB is, you know, not to counter. So, but I know a lot of companies do. Are there anything to add to that? No, I kind of agree. I think if I look at like lessons learned and, you know, I think there's a statistic somewhere, Linda probably knows the statistic, but if you counter offer uh, from a money standpoint, because a lot of people, that's really what happens. They get stimulated from some recruiter, they get on these conversations, they get an offer, which we all know that for that period of time is very taxing on someone's life, you know, preparing for that, your month, your head's in a different game. And then 
and then this offer comes and if to, to the counter offer I read something somewhere that within a year's time that like 80% of those people that took that counter offer end up leaving anyway so there's probably something a little bit more under the surface um, so I would say that that's a factor but as a company what we have control over I feel like it's really important that we for our especially for our critical talent or for people that we see as highest potentials is to be really engaged with those individuals at all leadership levels not just their direct manager to kind of understand what their longer term aspirations are and try to put projects and things in front of them to keep them stimulated and learning more so when they get those opportunities internally that they feel like they'd be you know have those skill sets even if that wasn't their job and so I feel like those are the best kind of practices at least what I've seen um, gives people a chance some people think they need to leave the company if they're in sales and want to get into marketing they leave the company to go do that somewhere and then they realize they absolutely hated marketing so why not try it out where you work and take on a project with the marketing team and and see that like yeah this isn't for me I've done that a lot and I think it really does help with retention. It helps people feel like you're actually invested in them. Um, and I've had that fortunate experience here with some of my my leaders. So I think, you know, the counter offering is pr probably the worst idea. <laughs> I really do. As much as it's so painful, you know, one of your best talents are going to walk out the door. It's just at the end of the day, it's probably a short term fix to a longer term problem. Great comments. Uh, I like what you said there as well about uh, people are interested in spreading their wings into different functions, you know, really allowing people to, as, as I say, dip your toe in the water without drowning, you know, uh, so that you can learn from that and see if it truly is something you like. Um, an interesting question that's coming from uh, one of the listeners, Adam. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand it, so I'll say it and then, uh, and then we can see if anybody can interpret it. He says, as opposed to the great resignation, there also seems to be quiet quitting perhaps even sometimes loud quitting. How can leadership deal with uh, this quiet quitting? I'll well, put anybody on the spot there, but uh, who has any thoughts on that? Yeah, the quiet quitting, which I'm now, you know, now with so many layoffs, I feel that we've kind of, yeah, as we were saying earlier, gone full circle. People aren't leaving as much, but the with the quiet quitting, it's again, you know, as a manager, as a leader, making sure that you are in tune with what's going on with your employee. Are, are they dealing with burnout? Are they struggling with some mental health challenges because of COVID? Are they, um, is their work just not meaningful to them anymore? So just maintaining those connections because yes, the quiet quitting, the maybe just kind of coming in every day and not doing your job and then eventually leaving is, it, it happens, but it's, it's, it's on us as managers and leaders to make sure that we are in tune with what's going on with our employees. Communication is key. Anybody want to add anything? Yeah, no, I, I agree heavily with that statement. I think, you know, there are touch points and things, particularly to kind of look at patterns. I mean, I know we get busy as leaders to kind of look and see what's going on. Um, you know, sometimes people just stay under the radar and they're really effective. And so you wouldn't even notice. And so maybe just keeping tabs on things, because I think it has been a, a big factor in some, some cases for people doing that and kind of checking out. I think the remote thing for the employees that normally come to an office, there's that part of it. And for people who maybe hadn't worked remotely, and then now they are, they're trying to figure out how to navigate that. You know, I've, my whole career has pretty much been spent remotely. And so for me, it's not any different, but for people that hadn't done it, they have a hard time finding that balance. Like if I'm at home, I should, you know, be doing the laundry or whatever. The rest of us know our houses are a mess, those of us that work remotely. So it's just, it's what it is. So maybe it's just guidance there. Um, but I, I couldn't agree with Linda more. Like you got to stay on top of the engagement with your team. And I think if there is feeling of that, just more and more touch points, it, you don't let them be quiet. Right. And then I saw the comment about the loud quitting and that becomes a factor for sure that when someone starts to become disgruntled in whatever way and they start to be a little bit, you know, unhappy in their role and they start to maybe take down the team or whatever as a true leadership thing that you have to nip in the bud because there's nothing more toxic than, you know, someone who's, you know, not not being a team player or, or calling out things. It's OK to be very honest, but it's not OK to to try to drain the, the ecosystem. Yeah, great. Do you know anything you want to add there? Or? Yeah, I mean, the, the most important thing is always being communicative with uh, with the team that you have and with the manager. If you have any concern in your in your in your private life, even just nothing related to work, but it's something that's stressing you out, it's maybe it's also a good idea to bring this um, bring this to the team and and maybe everyone will be more include will be uh more tolerance about the the, the the kind of situation and, and showing more understanding of with what it's going on um what i don't really like is having someone who it's um who it's not very supportive to other team um other people in the team and maybe they're complaining of uh complaining certain certain um 
certain processes or operation, um, but then they are not really um, giving a very positive working environment to the team. And I think this, this could be quite detrimental to the employee's health as well. Yeah, great comment. There's actually a question just came in about uh, health, so maybe I can ask you, Linda, and then I'll, I'll preface this by saying none of us are lawyers on the phone, so uh, uh, you know, don't uh, don't uh, take it any feedback in that uh, regard. But the question does resolve around um, you know what can managers talk to employees about uh, health issues, mental or physical, if they do see a problem in performance. What's, what what advice would you give that manager? I would say it's okay to say, how are you doing? Is there anything that is impacting your work that I should be aware of? Because I'm noticing X, Y, and Z. And if they say, well, yes, a family member has been struggling or I'm struggling, then you say, you know what, we have resources available to you. I encourage you to talk to HR. And then from there, we, we in HR will certainly handle those discussions. But it's okay to ask, how are you doing? That's great advice. Thank you. All right, we've got about five minutes left. So there was one question I was saving uh, towards the end uh, that uh, came in also from one of the audience members. And the question is, uh, as, as a group panelist uh, with various levels of expertise in the life sciences, could you provide any insights into your own career progression and perhaps a pivotal moment that uh, uh, you recall that uh, really was a turning point in the advancement of your career? I'll give you a moment to think on that, but I thought it was a nice way to finish. Um, Heather, do you want to kick us off? Sure, sure. So I think um, I think as far as like the progression, so I started probably in a traditional sense of being at a at a scientific bench as a you know a lab tech, and then moving into like a sales sort of role, and then stayed in that function selling for a long time, and then to leadership, and so and then you know from there expanded my career. So I think if you look at a trajectory, it went pretty like. In it, as you'd expect it to go. I was never conscious of the decisions I was making. And if I were to go back to my 25 year old self, I would have a better plan about my career. I have zero res, you know, regrets or reservations. It's just that I just kind of like, you know, just kind of got up every day and did the same thing and just, you know, worked hard and did all these things. And I think that if, you know, there's things I haven't done in my career that now I probably couldn't off the way till I retire to go do those things. And maybe I would have done those a little bit younger to test the waters a little bit. Uh, for example, product management and things like that. Like I see it now and I'm like, oh, that would have been interesting to be part of something like that. But like, there's no way that I'm going to be that today or that anyone would want me to be that at this point. So I think from that standpoint is like, take that, take that, those chances. Um, as far as pivotal for me, I think it was in my first leadership position. Um, you know, I look back at my career and I never felt so motivated for anything until I started leading a team. So I know that at the end of the day, I should have been in a leadership capacity that could have been in any kind of probably fashion or function. So I think that, you know, trying to kind of understand the person that you are and then have some goals to get there. Um, I try to tell that to everyone, like, don't be afraid to take chances. I have you know, three young adult children and I tell them like, don't worry about it. Like get your degree. Yeah. Like if that's what you want to do or a trade or whatever, but like, don't worry about it. You have your whole life ahead of you, right? Just live within your means and be happy. Like that's the biggest picture. So I think for anyone that's kind of thinking like, what's that pivotal moment? It's what you make of the pivotal moment and what that pivotal moment could be multiple times throughout your career. Um, but no, I, I, I think that there's not a better career in the world than the life sciences, if you want my honest opinion on this. And so I have one child of three that has gone into the sciences. He thinks he's going to be a doctor. And I tell him we all thought we were going to be doctors. So we'll see what happens with his career. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful nuggets in there, Heather. So thank you. Uh, Tina, anything you'd like to uh, speak about your own career? Yeah, similar to Heather, I actually don't regret of my uh, career choice. I mean, I have, okay, a very short career, uh, but um, am I because I'm coming from more technical background and the more natural choice would be more working in the lab being a technician or being a researcher being a scientist but I decided to join marketing because I do have a passion in marketing and I know my personality that I want to think a little bit outside of the box and can use more creativity in my day job so uh, right now I'm very satisfied with my with my choice in marketing. And I think uh, there was a critical moment in the past two years that I was working in Resolve and that is when my manager left. And uh, she has always been a mentor for me and, and she taught me on, on a lot of things. And so I was uh, quite dependent on her, but uh, when she left, I have to handle a lot of things all by myself. And I think one of the, and of course there are a lot of stress coming in as well. And because you, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out my way and I need a lot of uh, insights from different people. And one critical advice is to not to be afraid of asking help from the others and don't let people, don't 
just to uh, you can be vulner vulnerable even when you are working. Um, I think it's not right to say that you always need to fake it until you make it. Um, you just need to ask um, help from different people and try to learn in the process and then you can be more independent and that could be uh, helpful for your career development. Very well said. Linda, any uh, additional thoughts you have on yourself? Lots of comments already been made here. Yeah, I'll be real quick. My non-traditional HR career in that I actually did an internship at a college or during my senior year in college, got hired from the job in HR. And so I've been doing HR ever since. Most HR folks kind of fall into this, but I've been doing this um, ever since I did my internship in college. So, but for me, the pivotal moment is working here at New England Biolabs. Um, I think I've shared some of the reasons why I, I've been here for 15 years, but I've grown as an HR professional, but more importantly, I've grown as a person. I have, um, I used to joke with Jim Ellard all the time because he's he's somebody that wants everyone to succeed. And I would say to him all the time I'm, when he would give me feedback, it was a learning and growing moment. So um, I've grown as an individual, which I'm really proud of. Wonderfully well said. So some notes I wrote down quickly there. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, advocate for yourself. Uh, you're your best uh, champion and embrace change because uh, you can't control that. And uh, it did it, uh, um, sort of... Uh, opportunities come with it let's say so we're up on the hour i want to uh, thank tina i want to thank heather i want to thank linda for all the great commentary and uh, questions they've answered uh, over the last hour with me uh, i want to thank uh, the audience for joining and participating through the questions that uh, you've asked hopefully this has been valuable to you and finally a reminder take a look at the uh, samps uh, website samps.org uh, where you'll actually find uh, details of uh, the event that we'll be holding face to face in uh, december so thank you again and uh, thanks for joining us thank you andy